Okay, here we go. <laughs> so we've just met a couple of days ago. But we're the oldest of friends now. <laughs> we are. What we've been through together in the last 24 hours. <laughs> What have we been through? <laughs> we, we, we said we'd keep it to ourselves. <laughs> it's not the place. <laughs> anyway, instant friendship. And doesn't that just happen? Instant friendship. And doesn't that just happen at lovely, beautiful festivals like this? And doesn't that, that, that just happen with trees? Instant friendship. So, let's give a big thanks for the trees. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and wow, what trees there are on this site. Absolutely incredible. Just wonderful to be with such big old trees. Just feel very blessed. Mm. And the nest, which has been my place in this festival, has just nestled in the trees. It's just been a wonderful embedded experience. Would you like to say something about what you've been doing? Well, I mean, so maybe some of you have been, if you haven't, we're just beyond the sacred glade. And, um, and I guess the beautiful thing is that the, 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 the trees are our amphitheatre. And it's been, they are our, they're our acoustic. They are, our, they are what have created our home there. And I love the way that we've had this opportunity to curate the music and the trees have curated the space. Um, and that's that relationship um, ha makes the music sound so much sweeter. It certainly does. And, and maybe yeah. we'll talk a bit more about the sweetness of music and trees as well, because I think the two go hand in hand. And there's definitely a very ancient relationship with song and the woods. Um, We'll, we'll talk more about. Mm. So I had a I had a whole talk prepared. I didn't think Sam was coming because he'd been poorly, and um, so, but Sam was here. <laughs> so I said, "Well, shall we? You know, let's, what are we what are we going to do?" So I had a plan. <laughs> Sam I said, "No plan." <laughs> <laughs> Planning is essential. Plans are useless. <laughs> But there is a plan. And there is a little plan. I have a little plan. <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> glenny has got a plan. It's all going to be OK. <laughs> um, so in this bag is um, R. Uh, a lot. Did you take one? You have got one. There won't be enough for everybody, but... Um, I'm going to send them round, and they're apple ones. Thank you, Christopher. So these are pocket ones. And it was um, something I started doing, was collecting little bits of twig in the woods and putting them in my pocket. And, um, and then making little affirmations and um, pledges and... They also, for me, contain the journey. So if you're lucky enough to get one of those ones today, they will contain the journey that we are having now. <laughs> so one of my big things is f creating relationship, absolutely. Um, relationship and is an embodied experience, and so by creating a relationship, whether it's a wand, whether it's with each other, whether it's with a tree, we, um, we have an experience. And an experience, we, experiences we know. When we read it, we don't know in our deep inner soul, but experiences we know. So um, the little wand is a connection to this moment in time. This is Silver Birch. If you didn't get one... <laughs> we should have sold them afterwards, we should shouldn't we? <laughs> that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I want, to, I want to magically fill your wands. There's a verse... There's a verse in folk, folk song um, that's, uh, that's recurring. It's a song that's not attached to one particular song. That it's known, they're known as the floaters. 
Um, and it's this lovely idea that um, a little bit like how folk songs are like a, a, a plant or a tree, that they are rooted and they have a, a relationship with a, a sense of place. Um, but within them, there's also the kind of the verses that take from one to the other, like the pollen, the, like the, the seed heads, the, the dandelion seeds. And they can affix themselves from one song to another. And this is a verse that's often called the one of the warning songs, one of the warning verses. It's, and it's about the, the journey of growing old. Um, and it's a warning for younger women about um, where they should place their affections and the, the fickleness of beauty and how it tempts. Um, and, and this is about building your nest um, and where one should build a nest. So I'd like those who have a wand here, um, just, um, yeah, this is this to, to be pointed in the direction of beauty, wherever that may be, to yourself, to the sky, to the ground. And I just sing this to the trees. Um, and this just this one verse from this bit comes from the yellow handkerchief that maybe some of you know. It's a beautiful, um, beautiful song. Come all you pretty fair maids. Take a warning by me And never build your nest, my love In the top of a high tree For the green leaves, they will wither And the roots, they will decay and the beauty of a fair maid, they will soon fade away. And that is it. Mm. No, 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 no applause, no applause needed. That's, that's the spell, one of the spells. And your, your ones, I guess, will grow with the more spells you put in it. Is that how it goes? Absolutely. Um, Glenny, can I ask you about, um, can you tell me a little bit, I'm going to ask you a question about, if you could describe a moment you've had that has held with you, a moment with a tree um, in history that was a, was a changing moment, a moment that took you into an, uh, the next place of a relationship with trees, an understanding, like that time you have with a great friend where you realise you've so much in common. Do you have one particular? Well, n not necessarily one particular, but a, uh, a, a particular experience I had in my 20s when um, I, ki I wanted to learn how to draw because I felt my drawing was very childlike. And um, I started... Um, <laughs> with a 400-year-old oak tree. And I sat with this oak tree. I sat with my pencil, my rubber, rubbing out the tree. The tree just sat there, solid, didn't move. The light changed, but the tree was there. And I eventually found my way into how to draw with that tree, kept returning. And then I went on to hawthorn trees, ancient old hawthorn, twisted hawthorns in the hedgerows. And um, what I noticed was it was a very, very different experience. So no longer solid, rooted, but very playful. And within the bark, I saw lots of little faces looking out at me. There was this kind of sense of there's more going on than I thought. <laughs> and that was the moment, really. Mm. So, but back to what I said earlier, it was because I had relationship. I created a situation, unbeknown to me, where I was sat drawing, learning how to draw, but sat with the trees long enough, and that's the thing about trees, you have to be still. You have to sit and be. You can't just scuttle by. 
and expect them to reach out and say hello because you've gone in a, in a flash of light, gone. You have to sit with them, you have to be. And that's the hugest lesson that inadvertently life taught me by wanting to learn how to draw. Lovely to hear. Um, it's very, it's just a, a little bit of a little bit of background. Before I was a folk singer, I was very much involved in ecology, nature connection work. That's been my journey since I was very, very young. And trees were my were my sanctuary. Um, as a as a kid at school, I had this sort of superpower that I was a really I was a very bullied kid. I was easily teased and uh, uh, became the bit of the kind of that kid in the class. And but I had a tree that when they came after me. I knew if I ran fast enough to this old beech tree, I could get the low branch, jump up and swing up, and I was safe in there. And it was this amazing thing that at least once a week, I would be charging across the, 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 the playing field to get to this tree <laughs> with a bunch of guys behind me. And it was like, I always knew I was faster than them and could get in this tree. And that has always been this, for me, this sense of protection that I've I felt, and they've sort of protected me ever since. Uh, the, beat, the, the wonderful beech tree in Hampstead Heath, the, 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 um, the beanstalk, many of you may know it, has been a place of, of growth and learning, and many of my firsts have happened in that tree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not all of them. <laughs> um, and so it, they've, they've been a wonderful place to be up high as well, that sense of cradledness. But I was just kind of thinking about, interestingly about that song, this idea of the obsession with beauty um, and how when we see old trees, the older and more um, abstract and gnarled and odd a tree, the more we adore them. And a young kind of straight-limbed thing we kind of don't pay much attention to, which I think is a shame because I think young trees need as much listening to and connection with as old trees. They have a lot to say. Um, and those who've spent time working with trees will know that a, a young birch, uh, a, young, a young lime tree can be very insightful. And yeah. planting trees, we need to plant trees with that connection. We can't just plant them and leave them. We need to be making that connection, returning. So um, if you plant a tree, I just want to get this in, really. If you plant a tree, then spend time with it. Go back to it. Talk to it. Take it water in the summer. You know, create the relationship. Sorry to interrupt. I agree. Tell them about the other trees out there. Trees of your life, too. Um, have conversations. They need, uh, you know, the, the mother tree concept very much needs that the trees need that that nurturing and that culture brought to them. Um, I, I've had a, a very profound week last week um, in experiencing what it's like to be. It's very interesting being in the parkland here. This landscape that we live in, that we're living in at the moment, is a very kind of interesting one. Um, as we're beginning to learn more and more about this idea of what our landscape looked like and the kind of the field oaks and sweet chestnuts and wood pasture that there is here is very much in many ways modeling, a somewhat modeling a, uh, a way that this country looked like in post-glacial times. And I've just returned on Monday this week from leading a wilderness expedition in Romania in the Carpathians. And the interesting thing about that part of the world is that it is the last ostensibly uh, true wilderness that we have left in Europe. There, the Beavisha forest in Poland also are unique for being um, still landscape that has primal forest. Um, there, I'm working with, uh, with the teams who have been rewilding bison, and we were there tracking bison, who are amazing ecosystem engineers, and in many ways, the great enemies of trees, because they go around debarking them, pushing them over, creating meadowland. But what that also does is create diversity and space where light can get in and soil regeneration through uh, enormously destructive tractor-like practice processes. But what you experience in these primal beech forests is trees that are not these beautiful stately ones. They are rotten, collapsing, falling over each other, vast, des kind of scenes of destruction. There's as much death in the, in the landscape as there is life. 
And it's very enlightening that what you feel there is not this sense of decrepitness, but true aliveness. Because there is a sense of vitality. And there are words that in my vocabulary that, that kind of don't go far enough to describe that sense of feeling a vibration, perhaps a sense of aliveness and health. Like seeing the sparkle in someone's eyes who's just really drunk from the, the right you know, pot, pot of juice all their life. And the land there is, um, is very giving of that sense of, of story. That the soil there is rich and fungi. The insects are profuse. And you know that when there's a lot of insects, there's a lot of life. Because they they're that liminal place. They are the sort of... Um, they're the sort of... Uh, the score, when you look on an orchestral score, it's the difference between looking at a solo instrumentalist and their one line and an orchestral score full of black spots everywhere. Um, the forest out in, in Romania is a concerto. It's a full orchestra. And I sometimes find that what I'm listening to in, in places in this country is a slightly broken score, um, f fragmented and not hearing all the instruments in harmony. Um, and this is something I'm guess as we were talking earlier, I'm very keen to kind of talk about because we have so much possibility of relationship building and spending time and the way you lead that and embody that, Denny, is, is wonderful. But I also think that what goes hand in hand with that receiving is also about the, what we can do to give back to create forests healthy forests and understanding of when we're with a tree and actually they are really struggling um, or they're lonely or they are um, they find that they don't have their children around them and that they are the end of a line in many ways and our forests are in desperate states right now for so many reasons game birds destroying the undergrowth oh, ballooning of deer um, there is this. I I go into forests and I feel like I'm in a hospital ward, um, sometimes of beleaguered patients not receiving the treatment or the care that they need, um, and I think that the work that we need to do there is as important as the planting new trees and also rewilding ourselves in that sense and learning that vocabulary. Um, do you want to speak to that? rewilding ourselves this is this is the journey isn't it this is the journey that we're all on this is why we're here at this point in time to undo the conditioning undo the lies that we are separate hey no we're not separate at all we feel our connection we know our connection so the more time we spend out on the land the more time we spend with trees the more time we spend with nature in whatever way whether it's in your garden whether it's in the park wherever it is the more time we spend with nature the more we learn that we know it because we feel it so um Rewilding ourselves begins with just stepping off the map and spending more trust, giving ourselves more trust, trust to be ourselves and trust to pick up. What, what are we picking up? When we slow down, we pick up a, a lot of information from the plants, from the trees, and it's trusting that. It's, it's giving ourselves a space to be able to hear that. Um, and the other thing to say about rewilding the land is that planting trees is wonderful and it's really good that we're you know, aware of the fact that we need to plant them. But you know, the trees who plant themselves, the seeds that plant themselves, and the connections that seeds planting themselves in little clusters of ecosystem make themselves, they're the most powerful. Not the trees that have been planted, but the trees that have connected and planted themselves. And we need to be encouraging. So in my little hometown, we've just like 160 people have 
um, recently all, all put money in from, you know, from a few quid to a few thousand and a few hundred. And we've just bought 11 acres of land uh, just to go wild. We just, the sheep are off. <laughs> so, and, um, you know, apart from, uh, we, we're going to dig out a bit, of a, a bit of a dew pond that was there on the old maps. So, and got completely silted up. We are just going to leave that to go wild. And I think that's what the land needs. It needs us to go wild. And <laughs> it needs uh, the land to be able to return in its own way. And if you have the birch wand, um, birch is the first tree that moves in to um, new ground that's had the sheep taken off or had the, had the deer had the deer, um, what is it? You know what I mean. Sort of grazed. <laughs> stop the deer, or anyway. Stop the deer getting in, stop the sheep getting in, so the trees can grow. And out will pop the silver birch very, very quickly. And then that's a nursery, and the, the silver birch will um, create the new beginnings for the forest. And that takes time. And... You know, we, we just need to give nature a bit of time and a bit of space, and nature will reclaim itself. It's strong. We've really, you know, we've, we've made some messy, messy, messy decisions, and we won't go into that history, but um, nature is strong, and that's really important to remember that. And so... So if you have the silver birch, um, that is the new beginning that starts for you right now in this moment from this, whatever you've gained from listening to us to this morning. So into that, into that um, rewilding yourself, rewilding the land. Can I tell a story about the Absolutely, silver birch? Absolutely, please do. This, the idea of them being a pioneer species um, and that amazing work they do is of, of creating the mycorrhizal and the fungal relationships that then allow the secondary wave of, of, of oak, beech, lime, hazel to, to come to the land to create that amazing mosaic. Um, but the silver birch holds this very important place for me as well. So my, my lineage, um, my name Lee comes, actually comes from a different tree, comes from the lime tree. Lee is, was changed from the Polish Lipnitsky when my Jewish uh, forefathers and mothers arrived in the country about 120 years ago. And, and, uh, and they, worked with the, they worked with the lime trees, so they were, they were cloth makers and tailors. And the, lime, the word lime, uh, linden, comes from the word line, rope. It was the rope making tree, flax also became li linen, um, uh, but that connected to the linden. And uh, they made cloth from the bark of lime trees. But the Jewish partisans in the, uh, in the, uh, the war era depended on the silver birch because a very powerful uh, medicine. Um, the, the, the kind of partisan groups that lived out in the Polish forests and were sabotaging railway lines um, and ar armory routes for uh, the the German armies um, during that period, lived out in the forests uh, in hiding. Um, and I'm not directly related to them. Uh, my family were already over here during that, that period. But their story has always been very inspirational about how they built these, um, these encampments entirely out of silver birch, because that was the wood that was available. But what they also did was make um, a decotion from the bark. Now the bark, anyone who like knows about fire, knows that the silver birch bark is rich in this kind of bitumen and is an incredible fire lighter. Um, and anyone who's out in a forest seeing a fallen silver birch will peel a bit off and stuff their pockets and then comes out in the washing machine unused and <laughs> have this constant issue with bits of silver birch bark all over your house and in your pockets uh, for that possible moment to light a fire. Um, and then you never have it when you actually do need to light a fire. <laughs> <laughs> as we had trying to open our uh, nest space. Anyway, um, but what would we, um, the, 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 the Jewish partisans would gather lots of bark, and there's a technique of taking the oil using tin cans inside each other. You create this kind of this still, and they would create vast amounts of this black, sticky pitch that comes, which smells wonderful. 
but it was the kind of material that kept the whole camp together. Everything that needed to be stuck, all the bits of weaponry they were making were using this tar that would then get hardened in the fire. When people were shot, they'd come back and their infected wounds would be filled up with this antiseptic black ooze. And it was this kind of material that's both liquid and solid, antiseptic and uh, powerful. And it would kept everything together. So I've always kind of seen as these trees of having this kind of extraordinary sense of protection and did incredible work to help these, these families that were fighting for their lives um, to just do that important damage to, to the kind of enemy. And in some ways, it holds a bigger metaphor, I think, that healing work that they did there, also in the way that Silver Birch will come back, will have their time again in, you know, in, the, in whatever the aftermath of whatever is about to happen. Silver Birch will have their time to return and to, to be starters again for a new ecology that emerges, I think, after whatever climate change does to this planet. It's, it's a kind of place of imagination, but I think it's so important that we look at these trees as not only under threat, but also maybe in some ways those beings that are going to come and start it up all over again in years to come. Yeah, that's that. Oh, thank you for that. That's really and the the power of storytelling, just telling our stories, and that's what you do so well. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, the um, it's one of the first ways to rewild yourself, really is to learn what are these, what can I use these trees for? What are the properties? What, how can I use it for my own healing? You know, just, there's so much, there's so much. There's no need to go to the doctors. <laughs> 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 and there's so much to forage, but not taking too much. We have to be really, I mean, I've been a, a, a forager for years, but now I don't forage from the wild. I just fill my garden with all the things that um, I like to forage. So my garden is a jungle of delights, medicinal, edible. And um, ah, the first thing I did was plant an elder tree. because I absolutely adore elder. And so I have, you know, that wonderful elderberry tincture that is our immune system booster that's so beautiful and so easy to make. And uh, we can make that so easily. And I don't take from the, well, I take from the birds who want them, of course, but, <laughs> but I don't take from the wild. More and more increasingly, I don't take from the wild because the wild needs the wild. But that's a, that's a really good thing you could do to rewild yourself. Get to know what if, of our native species we can eat, we can m medicate ourselves with, and what trees that w we need for our hearts when we need to make connection. You know which tree to go to. Mm. It, it's really interesting, this idea of the kind of the rewilding is about um, actually forgetting a lot of what we've been led to believe. Um, and just returning back to what uh, I was witnessing in Romania, as I see also in places of um, nature reclamation in the UK, places like Net Rewilding Estate, I, I work in quite a lot, and um, Glen Affric and uh, Glen Feshi in Scotland, where the big rewilding programs are happening there. And also Wild East, amazing work there of creating 10% of landowners' land in that amazing project there. If you're East Anglian and have land there, even if it's just a pocket garden, go and explore But uh, their work. But seeing how the natural processes are such wonderful teachers in actually what, what nature needs that um, and that sensitivity that often I think we, we're, we're very timid in wanting to, to take because we feel we might be doing damage and actually where we have to remind ourselves and that we are obviously part of nature but we're also part of a process that needs us. We are, we are damage makers but that damage if done with a sense of what that how that impact can be generous 
and uh, and profitable can be very powerful. There's the, the wonderful relationships we, we know about, the, the, the thorn being the mother of the oak, the jays and the acorns, and w where regeneration happens naturally, it doesn't, they don't just happen by chance. They have an ancient, ancient relationship into species that create the, the cradles and the, 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 the kind of the space where regeneration can happen. And we can go and tinker with that. We can become nature by going and pretending to be more jay-like, more bison-like. It's one of the practices I love doing. I mean, I also like the singing because the singing is, for me, my way of tuning in. But actually, the you start looking at what a, what a bison can do in terms of like, or wild boar, which we so happy to have back in this country, about how they, I'm just gonna be really controversial, how they'll destroy a fucking bluebell forest. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, what bluebells? The no, 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 no. Bluebells, bad, bad. Seeing a whole carpet. Blue Where should there be a monocrop of flower like that? What that is is an absence of other plants, because we don't have wild boar. Wild boar will go into a bluebell wood, and they will create squares and turf. Now eat the bulbs and create this wonderful space for other species that are m less powerful than bluebells to so come in to create an absolute bouquet of underfloor forest. What we're seeing is an imbalance and a over, uh, an overwhelm of one particular species. They look wonderful, yes, absolutely, and I love them. But actually, um, it's a fake environment. It's an absence of species. And I think understanding that and starting to see how we can go into places and do what a wild boar would do, or you know, or 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 see where um, see where we can create those niches of opportunity by eating loads and loads of raspberries and then going taking a great big dump in, the <laughs> in a field. <laughs> That's what the bears do. The bison rip open the land and then the bears, having feasted, know to go and shit right where the bison have been. What do you get? These enormous raspberry bushes, which then mean when you go and you see all the raspberries, you start going picking them and are stuffing your face in Romania and then suddenly you realize there's also a, a brown bear drunk on raspberries right in front of you. Um, that's what we need in this country. That's what rewilding is. It's often being shit scared to go outside. Um, sorry, I don't know what's happened. It's all those, it's all those compost loos. <laughs> I hope they just spread it on the land afterwards. That would do the work. <laughs> anyway, I don't know where that's gone. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> I brought it to the lowest point. <laughs> but, um, but I guess what I'm saying really is that, that um, the, the thing that about spending time in wild places is it's about observation. It's about sparking that curiosity. When you start having these conversations, you start seeing where health is, where, where a tree is, like, is, 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 is being kind of having a good life, I guess. And in that tuning in, you often see actually what's going great and, and what's affecting it, uh, that, that, that being. And um, if we were to have a greater sort of baseline of understanding, not just here, it's pr pretty high here, but within our education system, within our, uh, our government, you know, I'm looking at people in the room here who I know have been working very hard on governmental policy that is utterly you know just ignorant to what nature needs and looking at the the where imagination can stem for the arts and creativity to come out of of a land that is wealthy and full of species that should be here like red back shrike and bee eaters and pelicans and what it would be like to be in a country that's enriched with the uh, the insect life and trees that are really kind of you know happy we would have a happier country. We could create an economy of nature appreciation that would create so many thousands of jobs and a greater kind of sense of stewardship that you see in other countries, Scandinavia particularly, in the, uh, some of the East, and particularly Poland, particularly Romania, um, and actually how profitable it could be emotionally as well as Financially, and I think I have to bring this in because there's no point if there isn't a sense of possibility for people's l livelihoods to be made by that. Um, and 
for me, it is about an absence of imagination of what a, a healthy environment could be. But the impacts on well-being and a generation of children who are growing up seeing a, a, a shifting baseline going upwards as opposed to downwards is, is such a wonderful opportunity. And I think this country could lead on it. And I think we each lead on it, each and every one of us. We lead on it. Just We just get on with it. In whatever way you can do it, do it. Because um, we don't need to wait for permission. And we don't need to wait for the rest of them to catch up with us. We're ahead. We're already ahead because we're already making those connections with nature. We're already changed by our connections with nature. So, um, but we can't just be changed by nature. We have to let that um, fill us up and then ask nature, what can I do for you? And that's the big question. Ooh, what can I do for you? I've got something. Yeah. What can I do for you? <laughs> <laughs> and sit with that. And if you have an apple one, I'm just going to bring it back to the apple, keeping my eye on the time. Time, it <laughs> is a precious thing. It is a precious thing in this context. Um, if you have an apple wand, so the apple is about abundance, um, and you might think it was just outer abundance because the apple is, is abundantly feeding us with all its beautiful thr fruit and all their beautiful fruit and everything, but it's also about our inner abundance. And this is what we have to fill ourselves up with on the one hand. We are mightily abundant on the outer, and we have to fill ourselves up with what we're abundant on the inner. Because that's the bit that's impoverished. We're, we're as impoverished as the land is in this country because we've lost that connection. We've got ourselves disconnected. Well, we've been hoodwinked into being disconnected. So we have to give it back to ourselves. We have to give back our sense of being part of the whole. And if we, if we claim our sense of being part of the whole, then we claim our what do we, what can I do for you, Earth? What can I give back? So the apple wand is to fill yourself up with all the outer things. And if you haven't got an apple wand and you've got a birch wand, it's all the same. Fill yourself, fill your wand up, fill yourself up with all the outer abundance you have in this life as a very privileged person. So just let's have a moment with that. And fill yourself up with the joy of that. You know, we're, we have so much joy, potential joy. We have so much beauty around us, even though, as Sam says, compared to what he's seen, I've not seen it. But compared to what he's seen, it's we are impoverished here. But it's still a great abundance, isn't it? Wonderful, absolute wonderful beauty all around us. And on the subject of filling yourselves up, now we're really full of our outer abundance. Now let's put in our amazing intuition, our ability to be sensitive and receive from each other, from trees, from nature, from the land, if we can just be still enough for a little few moments longer. We have our, an amazing inner world that we have uh, only just begun to re-scratch the surface of. So it's re finding our connection, it's gifting ourselves back. Gift it yourself and make time for it. So in your little wand, just make time, just add. 
I make time for my inner connection. And the very, very best way I know is to sit with trees. Might I sing a song? Oh, please do. I, I, actually, we're all going to sing a song in a minute or two. Um, I was sort of unsure of whether I'd sing this song, mostly because I've probably not got much of a voice, and also I've never really sung this song before out out to in front of people. Um, and it's a uh, it's a song about a tree. Um, it's a song that I've written out of a very ancient folk song, not very far from here in Herefordshire, an old gypsy singer whose songs I'm very fond of, called May Bradley. Um, wonderful Romany gypsy singer. Um, has a has a very ancient ballad. It's called the, tr the the leaves of life, and I've taken that as a, a as a source for this song about the tree of life. Um, and this is a song about the seven generations yet to come, um, appearing at the tree of life and asking why the tree is in such disarray and it taps into this idea of abundance and scarcity, of the scarcity complex of how we've been led to believe we're not abundant and we need more. Um, so this is a song sung from the perspective of those children unborn. Um, and it goes like this. It's under the leaves and the leaves of life There comes children seven And one by one they'll come to ask What have we done? to heaven and where are the leaves and the leaves of life who gave us protection who gave root and bow to raise our vows why has she been forsaken? And she asks us what we are looking for All under the leaves of life We are looking for shade from us retrograde from the scorch, from the scythe and scathe And mother dear, you're a weeping tree For your weeping it does me harm For we've been entranced to the scarcity done well away by false idolatry Children go where I send thee How can I send thee Far from the trees of life Wheels tend to our dear mother's rage and be scribe to our father's grave Bright morning star arising Bright morning star arising Bright morning star arising Day is breaking in my soul. Thank 
Merci. I think it's the moment um, for a, a little something we do together. I almost just want to hold that moment. Sam created. Okay, so the um, the song is. Um, it's about, it's about our collective, our collective journey of, of refinding connection. And the words go, gather and share of the earth. I don't know if you'd like to just say that. Gather and share of the earth. Gather and share of the trees. Gather and share of each other. All the love and the light. And let us go shining as we walk. Shining as we walk. And let us go shining as we walk. Shining. As we, as we walk because you know when we shine it's the twinkle it's the twinkle that we're catching from each other it's the twinkle that creates relationship and as we make creation ship we share our stories um, everything changes so I'm just gonna sing um, gather and share of the earth Gather and share of the earth. Gather and share of the trees. Gather and share of each other. Gather and share of each other. All the love and the light. And let us go shining as we walk. Let us go shining as we walk. Shining as we walk. Shining as we walk. And let us go shining as we walk. Let us go shining as we walk. Shining as we walk. So just join in. Gather and share of the earth. Gather and share of the trees. Gather and share of each other. All the love and the light. And let us go shining as we walk. Shining as we walk. And let us go shining as we walk, shining as we walk. Gather and share of the earth, gather and share of the trees, gather and share of each other, all the love and the light. And let us go shining as we walk, Shining as we walk, and let us go shining as we walk, shining as we walk. Gather and share of the earth, gather and share of the trees, gather and share of each other.
we've we've a few more minutes, and there may be no questions. There might be a few questions. Um, if you have a question, maybe should we do like gather a few in our yeah. bundles and? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you, firstly, for your wisdom. It's beautiful. Um, I live in Bournemouth in Dorset, and I just like to know, from your knowledge. Um, where would be the closest ancient forest that I have? I know I have the new forest near me, um, but there's lots of stuff that's happened there and doesn't feel so ancient anymore. Um, so if you uh, know... Um, um, thank I you. could give an answer. Should we, should we take a few more? Maybe we could weave them together. Would that be all right? Hi, uh, I have a question as um, part of the art theme. The big thing about making Medicine Festival is using a lot of natural resources for land arts. So there have been lots of people picking flowers and cutting bits and pieces. And uh, I'm just curious on your opinion, especially Glenny, after you said that you don't really forage anymore, how, what do you feel like, how can we find a balance between you know, creating beautiful, natural, artistic environment, but at the same time, keeping the respect for the nature. Yes, we are living in, and we are in this forest at the, at the moment. Can you, tell, can you tell us something about this forest? Is it totally cultivated, or is it for a part natural? So that's my question. Mm. So maybe I'll answer those two together. Um, there's a real interesting mix. This is classic parkland, you know, estate uh, land that has been kind of created to, to emulate a sort of Paleolithic era um, of, you know, wild uh, herbivores. But you just step over where the nest is. We're in uh, a mixture of um, overstood sweet chestnut Coppice, if I'm right, our forester here, uh, was someone here who's been teaching me and learning. It's, it's basically overgrown coppice, which would have been amazing um, panage for pigs uh, and the deer love to, to feast upon. It's a nut forest over there. There's lots of hazel in there. And that's a wonderful landscape, which is very much human created. Um, and, and the way I want to relate it to, to your question is that ancientness doesn't always mean old. You can have an ancient forest that's actually got a lot of young trees. Coppice Woodland is one of the most kind of biodiverse spaces of where generations have been cutting back an ancient practice of death and regeneration. Um, and the sweet chestnuts, it's well worth, um, you're not actually allowed to, but I'm gonna tell you, to go and have a little wander up at the nest and around and look at some of those wonderful stools of sweet chestnuts that may be hundreds and hundreds of years old. The actual stem above ground might only be 40, 50, 60 years old. Um, but uh, we've got a really interesting soil that's shale here and it's um, loads of different mixtures of sort of s substrate. Um, beautiful places where they've been opened up and there's been new growth of light coming in. So there's a multiple different uh, landscapes. There's a lot of ash here which is dying back. But the sweet chestnuts are doing really well. And I think there's actually some really kind of, you know, healthy and kind of, you know, uninterfered woodland. One of the great things, is a lot of people in here. And I think the impact of that is that it stops the deer herds from really coming in and chewing back a lot of the new gro growth as other woodlands that are less populated by humans. I'd say for you, the new forest is the one of the most amazing places. You have huge number of species there. The wild ponies are doing amazing work, uh, replacing the tarpan, the uh, you know the, the the extinct wild horses, and you're very lucky to have that nearby. I think that we have to uh, do a little bit of. Uh, transgression in our search for ancient woods, and uh, I'm I'm great fond fondness for the invisibling of barbed wire fences and the right to roam. I'm a found one of the founder members of the right to roam team, and this idea about how we uh, we go into places like the Wazing Estate and just uh, imagine that we lived here too, <laughs> and it's amazing how you can reach some wild places that are only often accessed by the preserve of those who are wealthy and. Uh, we're very lucky to have the permission to be in here, but this is a rare example. So I'm going to invite people to uh, leap the barbed wire, uh, <laughs> maybe even bring bolt cutters with you. And, um, uh, and the bit that you can do back is by going and paying attention to how landowners are treating their land. And if they are not doing very good work to their land and breaking rules and dis being destructive, well, let's go and report them because actually that's what we can't do by being separated and stuck to footpaths and banned from 
places a little bit like this. So let's make it our, our duty to be, uh, yeah, the sort of, yeah, the wardens and the stewards of that in that way. And in answer to your question, if you're going to forage, I feel, you have to be giving back as well. You have to be giving back. Or, I mean, I've only got a tiny garden, but it's absolutely packed with medicinal herbs and plants and edible plants. So uh, even if you've only got a small patch, or, or um, you know, gorilla rewilding. Um, I'm also a huge fan of that. Uh, you know, planting out in your locality. And uh, again, in, in our town, we're, um, which, which is happening all over the place because councils haven't got the money to um, mow, um, the vergers are also becoming a great source. And, and, and along the motorways, that's a huge um, rewilding project, isn't it, that they didn't think about, but has happened. Um, but yeah, it's, if you're going to take... What do you give back? I think that's a really important thing. But it is important to know our native species and, and what we can gather and what we can eat and what we can do with it. So um, keep doing it, but with an awareness. Yeah. Uh, I sort of feel... I know that there is some research to say that planting by the ne next to roads is good, but I, I just can't help feeling concerned about all the chemicals that that vehicles pump out through their exhausts. Well, of course. Surely yes. that's not good. But, but s some trees are able to um, trans transform those chemicals better than others. That, that pops into my ma mind. But, you know, yeah, yeah, not good. Let's just, let's just get our cars off the road and let the trees break up the motorways. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Sam and Glennie, Sophie Banks just wanted to add, um, add, add one thing. Um, I just wondered if we could take a breath before we close for the grief and a breath for the hope or something like that. Because a lot of what you're saying is very impactful, isn't it? So would that be all right to Perfect. just include that? That would Perfect. be very... A breath for the grief and a breath for the hope. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a moment. Can we have a song, just a, a tone, to join in, in our last three breaths? Um, breath out, and in. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Christabel. Thank you, Sam.